Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here today. As Kathy said, I'm going to be talking about Augustus, uh, and this will be hopefully of interest uh, in relation to imperial image as part of the classive um, module. Um, so I've entitled this from August, from young Caesar to Augustus, um, Augustine Rome and the Res Publica, because uh, I want us to think about not only Augustus as a, an individual and what we might think about as his persona or multiple personae over the course of his life and particularly in terms of his public presentation, but also how that might correlate with what is happening to Rome and also the res publica, which is the term I'll come back to. You may have heard that term already in your studies. It's where we derive the idea of republic from, but it has sort of various nuanced meanings in the Roman period, and it's important for Augustus's self-presentation. Uh, so, Kathy, can I ask you for the next slide now? I'm going to be concentrating on Kathy next slide. Thank you. Um, so, I wanted to start off by what we actually meant mean by Augustine Rome, because I think it's an interesting question to ask, and I think there are a variety of ways of approaching what Augustine Rome means. We're talking about Rome under Augustus, but are we talking about the city of Rome as a civic entity and its physical architectural definitions and limits, or are we now using Rome to talk about an empire and the wider Mediterranean? Uh, and also, how does Augustus himself as an individual shape or influence how we view Rome? Um, and indeed, as I've already alluded to, who is Augustus and how do we think about him? Um, next slide, please, Kathy. Sorry, I've got quite a few slides. It's going to be... Have you any, has anyone seen this image or object before? A couple, yeah. Do you know what it is? No. Don't worry, yeah. I mean, don't worry if you haven't seen it either. This is just one object I want to use to initially think about Augustus, imperial image, what we might mean by Augustan Rome. This is a, a cameo, it's a gemstone. It's about, it's 19 centimetres high, 23 centimetres wide. Um, so, you know, it's sort of like this size. Um, and it's carved from onyx. So you can see the white image in relief and the rest of the stone has been cut back to a sort of blue brownish background. And it's a relatively sort of, you know, complex image. There's a lot going on, but it's an interesting sort of starting point to take a single object and ask what narrative or indeed narratives about Augustus and the Augustan age and ideas about the Roman state can we engage with through this single image? But as I'm sure you're all aware when dealing with any period of history, you want to think about context, about what the object or the piece of evidence is, what is its purpose, who is engaging with it as an audience in order to sort of further understand it. Um, and as I said, it, it is a complex image, but, and it's in two, two levels. We've got here effectively the central figure who is Augustus based on his portraiture. Uh, He's you know, heroically semi-nude, which is not how you'd normally expect to see him presented in public imagery during his lifetime. Uh, he has the eagle of Jupiter sitting underneath him. He is being crowned by a female figure who's wearing a turreted uh, headdress, which is um, effectively a city wall, but she's normally interpreted to be the oik numine, which is the Greek for the inhabited world. So we have him being crowned by a personification of the world uh, with a a bearded male figure who is normally understood to be Oceanus, so a depiction of the ocean, a female figure with a cornucopia or horn of plenty, and a <coughs> child, so Mother Earth, so we've got all these personifications on this side. He's sitting next to a female figure who is dressed as a warrior, who's normally understood to be a personification of Rome. Uh, but then we've got more figures to the far side, um, military figures. The figure on the far far side stepping down from a chariot with a winged victory behind him. And this is normally understood to be Tiberius, Augustus's stepson, and potentially this younger figure also dressed uh, in a military outfit as Germanicus, so the three generations. And underneath it, kind of almost as a sort of the base of what Roman imperialism is founded on, we have a scene of um, a trophy monument, a, a victory monument, a, a Roman soldiers erecting with the armour of their enemies, and we can see the treatment of um, barbarians, in inverted commas, uh, who are bearded, uh, semi-naked, wearing torques, uh, so thinking about sort of northern Europeans here, potentially, uh, as part of this display and celebration of, of Augustus. Um, 
when we're thinking about an object like this and the narrative it tells us, we might also want to think about when was it made. And the date for this particular item is, is not certain, it's not debated. It could be anywhere from the last couple of years of Augustus' life into the first couple of years of Tiberius's reign. So is this a, a retrospective on Augustus, as it were, and um, thinking about the dynastic implications of his successes and what he has created Rome as. Um, we also want to think about audience. This is, a, a, you know, it, it's not a tiny, tiny piece, uh, but, it, and it's, uh, but it's not massive, it's not monumental, it's a luxury item. Uh, the, the audience for it might be small and elite. Uh, it's often thought about in the context of the imperial court. So thinking about the, the types of people engaging with this image who might be interested in the messages it, it promotes. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So apologize, I apologize for the really, really bad quality of this coin image. This, believe it or not, is actually a gold coin. It's incredibly hard to find a good image of it. It is an uh, Aureus, so a gold coin minted in 12 BC. Um, and what it depicts on, on the obverse, on the head side, is the head of Augustus. Uh, and it says Augustus D.V. Filius, so Augustus, son of the divine. Uh, on the reverse, though, the, the, the tail side, we have a, um, a, a figural scene of one standing figure who is wearing a toga and one kneeling figure who is sort of lifting up their hand and perhaps being raised up by the standing figure. And I know it's really hard to see from this image, but there are labels for these two figures. Very helpful. Um, the standing figure is labelled as Augustus and the kneeling figure is labelled as Res Pub, which is an abbreviation because Latin loves to abbreviate, particularly when there's not much space. So this is an abbreviation for res publica, res publica. So we have a, a personification, a female embodiment of the res publica and what that might particularly mean. Um, so this is an interesting sort of way of thinking about Augustus's relationship with the res publica and how it's being presented even decades after he sort of come to power. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, same coin. Uh, and just for comparison, a later coin uh, minted during the year of the four emperors, um, minted under Galba, so the first of the uh, four emperors who came to power after the death of Nero. Um, and this doesn't depict exactly the same scene, but it's there for sort of comparison and how this image of the emperor raising up a figure it becomes reused uh, later on. And just because this image might be slightly clearer, we have again a male figure wearing a toga who is Vespasian, a kneeling female figure. This time we have a, a third figure, a female warrior figure, who is likely the personification of Rome again. But this time the legend tells us, and you'll have to trust me because it's really hard to read on this coin, it says, libertas restitutit. So liberty, freedom, has been restored. And then underneath SC, uh, Sonatus Consulto by decree of the Senate although it's a bronze coin, so it's minted under the authority of the Senate. But this idea of the, uh, the toe-gate figure, the civic princeps, the emperor, lifting up ideals in relation to the Roman state. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So I've mentioned that coin with Augustus and this personification of the res publica, but actually what does res publica mean, or what did it mean for a Roman audience? As I mentioned previously, it's where we get uh, the English word republic from, and we talk about the Roman Republic um, as a period in history, uh, but also as a form of governance, a political institution of a republic, as opposed to the empire or the principate, uh, a monarchical form of rule that comes afterwards. Um, but for the Romans, um, Res publica literally means, if you translate it from the Latin, public thing, public matter. Um, Cicero wrote a political treatise called De Re Publica, which we might sometimes have translated as concerning the Commonwealth, but we might also just translate it as concerning political matters. And he and others use res publica also in the plural, talk about um, republics or commonwealths. And they can even apply this term to a monarchy. They can refer to uh, one man rule being a type of res publica. But it also is a term that the Romans again and again use to talk about their own political 
state and institution. So in Augustus's Res Gestae, which I hope you all have heard of, um, because it's such a useful source for understanding how he wants his, his time in power to be, uh, to be remembered. So um, one of the I was going to, sources. Yes, yeah, great. Um, this comes from really near the end of, of, the, of, the, of the text, of the inscription, and he tells us that in his sixth and seventh consulship, so in 28, 27 BC, after I had extinguished civil wars, although through the agreement of everyone I had power over all things, no small claim, I transferred the res publica from my power into the arbitration of the Senate and the people. He's effectively sort of claiming that he has control over everything, including the political affairs of the Roman state, and he's just giving it back, transferring it to the Senate and the people as an important conceptualization and embodiment of the Roman state. We might think about the well-known uh, abbreviation SPQR, Senatus Populus Romanus Que, um, although that might also be a, an Augustan framing of the state to put emphasis on the Senate. We have some earlier Republican evidence and inscriptions that refer to populus senatus quae Romanus, putting the people first. Uh, but I digress. Uh, whereby, so having, having done this wonderful, noble, selfless thing, uh, I was named Augustus by decree of the Senate because of my service. After that time, I exceeded all in auctoritas, so in authority or influence, but I had no more potestas, no more, and in this he's thinking about constitutional power attached to particular magistracies of the Roman state. No more power than the others who were my colleagues in each magistracy. And I think here Augustus is not necessarily lying. When he was consul, he technically had no more constitutional power than the other consul, because there were two. Uh, but what he's kind of not telling us is how many times he was consul and the various other constitutional powers he had on top. Although he is admitting to having greater influence through a variety of honours, um, including the name Augustus, um, uh, that through which he's wielding influence over the state. Have next slide, please. Um, excuse me. Yes. On the slide previously, did it say uh, section 34 of the address? Yes, it did. Absolutely well spotted. Yeah. So that's yeah, chapter 34. Um, uh, so that's what he's claiming. I just want to take a little bit of a step back um, and think about the collapse of the res publica, the Roman state, in what we call the Republican period. Um, I don't know whether or not you studied the period before Augustus. Don't worry if you haven't. Um, the period of the second mid-second century BC down to effectively the triumvirate um, of Mark Antony Lepidus uh, and young Caesar. The period that we refer to as the late Republic is often seen as a period of collapse and implosion of the Roman state. Um, and throughout this period, and sorry, these are the, the dates in brackets, so from 121 onwards, we have several instances of the Roman Senate passing a decree, which is effectively a decision that the Senate as a collective body have made, that is asking the consuls and other magistrates, so those are the annually elected officers of the Roman state, to do whatever is necessary to prevent the res publica, prevent the Roman state from, co from coming from, from suffering any harm. Uh, and this is often referred to in the scholarship as the, uh, the final decree of the Senate, the Senatus Consultum Ultimum. Um, that uh, is not a term that the Romans themselves used of the decree. It comes from the way that Julius Caesar describes this decree when it was passed against him in 49. He refers to it as the ultimate and um, the ultimum et, oh, what is it? He uses another, another, another adjective to describe it. Well, the, the extreme, the extreme and, uh, and final decree of the Senate. But effectively it's a Senate saying the state is in trouble and you, the magistrates, need to do something to protect it. And it is always in trouble from an internal threat. All these instances of Senate going, help, we're, we're, we're in a really bad state. It's because they're perceiving other elements within the Roman state, sometimes magistrates themselves and other officials, as acting against the interests of the state. So everything starts to get really messy internally. Don't worry about the Latin. That is just the Latin that we always see every time this decree is used in the text, which means that um, so that no harm comes to the Roman state. I have the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, 
So that's the kind of long setup over a century and a half before we get to Augustus. Um, we return once again to his race guest by this time, chapter one. So the beginning of his account of what he was doing on behalf of the Roman state. Um, at this point in 43 BC, he's only 19 years old. Um, and what he's doing is you know, quite extraordinary. So he tells us that the Senate ordered him as a pro-praetor. So a praetor is a magistrate of the Roman state. To be pro-praetor means to stand in place of. So he's been given powers comparable to a praetor. A praetor, by the way, conventionally and traditionally has to be 39 years old. So he's <laughs> 20 years ahead of his time. Um, together with the consuls, to see to it that, familiar phrase, the res publica should not, suffer, should not suffer any harm. So once again, this decree of the Senate, we're in really bad state, you need to do something, is coming into play. And he's using this as a way to explain why he's been given such exceptional power. In the same year, the people elected me consul. You have to be 42 to be a consul. Uh, but he's, he, you know, and he's now saying the people elected me. It was their choice. Since both consuls had fallen in war, and also elected me triumvir, so one of three men, a board of three men, that's literally what triumvirate means, for the settlement of the res publica. Um, if you look at inscriptions and coins from this period, that is often talked about as being the second triumvirate. I would say that it is the triumvirate, because the first triumvirate is not a formal triumvirate, it's not officially elected. But you'll see on their coins, we've got the Roman numeral for, fr for three, then we've got via, B I R, and we've got R dot P dot C, which stands for Res Publicae Constituendi, for the constitution, constituting or settling of the state. And this is what, and the coinage here depicts um, Mark Antony and then young Caesar, who would become Augustus, uh, Mark Antony and Lepidus. So we get these coins where the collegiality of these three men are being promoted on their coins and they're advertising the powers that they've been given in order to allegedly restore the state. The question of what are you restoring it to or how you're settling it is not really addressed. Have next slide, please. Yes, Augustus who though? We've been talking about Augustus and referring to him as Augustus, but I'd like us to think about actually who he is and how complex his image is, not just in terms of how it changes over time, but when we look at it through the sources, how complicated it could be. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, and these are just some images uh, that we might think about when we're constructing or reconstructing Augustus. Um, some of you might recognise the, this is a copy of the famous Prima Porta statue, but the difference from the original is that there is colour added to it. Um, and this is a much better reconstruction, I would say, than the one that is in the Ashmolean Museum, which you may or may not have seen images of, which is just blue, red, with brown hair, and it looks terrible. Um, and I actually think his hair should, should, should be golden, should be gilded, not brown, but that's another, another story. But here we have him represented as imperator, as general. He is wearing the cuirass, he's in military dress, he's in the pose of Adler Cutio speaking to the troops. And in this display, clearly from the museum, we have a map of the Roman Empire behind him, and I've even put him on a statue base with an inscription dedicating this to Imperator Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. The middle image, though, has him in quite a different guise, different dress, a different persona. Um, the, the, full, the full image of it is him wearing a toga with, with the hood of the toga up, uh, or with the fold of it over his head. And that is instantaneously a way of identifying someone as, as a priest or in a religious role. And Augustus held all the priesthoods you could possibly hold, uh, including being Pontifex Maximus, head of Roman state religion. On, on this side, we have, uh, let's call them further reinterpretations in the modern age. So this is from HBO's series Rome, which I think is almost 20 years old now, which is just kind of terrifying. Um, uh, Graphic image, uh, which I think is actually from Assass the Assassin's Creed series. Not that he yeah, ever, I think it's Assassin's Creed Origins, which is named set in Egypt. Um, I don't think he necessarily appears in, but I know this is a depiction of him in relation to that. And they've given him black hair and they've him very scowling, which obviously is an interpretation once again. And finally, this is just an image from a, a project which was using Photoshop 
to try and bring the images of the Roman emperors back to life, starting with Augustus and going all the way through. So you can see the um, original statue in the Photoshop. And I don't know about you, but whenever I look at this image, I see two people and I can't unsee them. One is Daniel Craig. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one is Vladimir Putin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make of that what you will. Um, let's go with Daniel Craig. I mean, the cross is like that. Can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> so, along with the various ways that Augustus might, might be presented and represented and, and, and interpreted, um, as I said, we're dealing with a range of different types of sources that are presenting aspects of him to us and through which we can judge him. But we need to evaluate the sources that we're dealing with and, and what narratives we're being told. Could I have the next slide, please? So I, I'm not going to go through these in detail. Kathy has the slides, so you can always refer to them later. But these are just... Um, Areas in which Augustus might be accused, or indeed has been accused, of being responsible for the destruction of history. Uh, so the unspeakable acts of violence that he deployed during the Civil War, and I will talk about this one in a bit more detail in a moment, including apparently sacrificing 300 um, surrendered individuals after the Battle of Perusia on an altar to Julius Caesar on the 15th of March in 40 BC. He's also accused of dismantling Republican democracy, uh, you know, and ba basically being a king in all but name, um, and is also charged with the erosion of personal civic liberties, again in creating a sort of monarchic state, uh, that he removes alternative narratives of history, so the erasure of um, alternative accounts of the past. Uh, we might think in the raised guest eye, he, he talks about his Roman opponents, but he never actually gives them their name. He talks about the men who murdered my father, uh, that's Brutus and Cassius, or he talks about a war against pirates, that's Sextus Pompeius, but he never actually names them. And he has been invariably accused of being a master of spin, of PR, of self-promotion, of propaganda. The man knew how to use media in all its various forms. Can I have the next slide, please? The flip side of that, though. Can I just make a point about yeah, please go ahead. The, the 300 yes. that were sacrificed I have to get into that, yeah. Perusia. Yeah. And yet the man who led that, Mark Antony's brother, was pardoned and given the... Exactly, yeah. This is where it becomes, actually, how reliable is the account we have from Suetonius. But you're absolutely right, Kathy, uh, that actually the, the main individuals were excused and were able to leave the siege un unharmed. So on that, on that particular point, um, Suetonius himself, if you read um, his account, and particularly in the Latin, he is perhaps unconvinced by the story. He just says... Um, certain people, and so Tony is actually not quite good at giving his sources, but you know, this is clearly a story that has come down to him, and we might question where it's coming from, uh, whose who's presentation. And actually, Suetonius, like Augustus, is littered with, um, you might refer to them as anti Augustan or anti Octavian um, sources, including those coming from Mark Antony and other opponents. Um, we also have, as we'll see in a moment, funerary inscriptions or at least one funeral inscription that uh, blames his colleague Lepidus for acts of cruelty, not at Perusia, but acts of cruelty in the Civil War, and praises Augustus for his clemency. If we're going to blame Augustus for the destruction of democracy, I mean, the Roman Republic was failing for a very long time. When you think about that final decree of the Senate I showed you, and that's initiated in 121, and then it's constantly repeated throughout the ensuing century. Um, that we might look upon the Roman Republic actually as a democratic oligarchy or a tyrannical oligarchy, power in the hands of a few individuals, not uh, in the sense of a Greek democracy where the people actually are able to vote and voice their opinions. Uh, and of course, Augustus does, did maintain Republican offices. He doesn't destroy the fabric of the Roman state. Another thing to think about is Augustan peace. After decades of civil war and even more decades of civil unrest, violence and murder, there's something very appealing, I think, about someone who's bringing an end to all that. And you can just get on with ordinary life. Um, and finally, Augustus is a master of spin or, or, or PR and propaganda. 
Yeah, absolutely. But he's not the only Roman to employ a variety of media, whether it's art or poetry or literature, to promote themselves. So he's continuing a Republican tradition. He's just doing it better than everyone else. I have the next slide, please. So just to go back to the point that Cathy raised about this sacrifice of the 300 and why it's interesting in terms of his characterization, perhaps also problematic. So this is um, Suetonius' account. Um, certain people, scribunt quidam, so he's not assigning specific authorship to this. Certain people write uh, that from those who had surrendered at Perugia, 300 were chosen from both orders, so the senatorial order and the equestrian order, the knights, senators and knights, and were slaughtered on the 15th of March in the manner of sacrificial victims at the altar constructed to the deified Julius Caesar. I mean, that's pretty damning. Human sacrifice in any circumstances is a bad thing. And obviously Augustus does not look good in this context. Can I have the next slide? I wonder, I, might, <laughs> I wonder to what extent we might view this story as a piece of anti-Octavian rhetoric. Um, that's one possible interpretation. I'm not saying he's blameless by any stretch of the imagination. But um, it's interesting because at this point he's, he's already declared himself to be Julius Caesar's heir. And there's a competition about you know, who is Caesar's heir. Um, Caesar, in, in civil war that he fought against Pompey, um, really rams home the point about his practice when he has captured his civil war opponents of allowing them to go safely away. He dismisses them safely. He captures them, often uses them as messengers to talk to the other side, but he never harms his opponents. So that they surrender to him or that they're captured, he releases them safely. Um, and actually, in Caesar's account of the civil war, he's the Bello Covili, um, he, he has his opponents uh, being the bad example of this. He, ha he presents his opponents as um, injuring people who have surrendered. So this is just one example from the third book of Caesar's Civil War. Well, Tertullius Crassus, who was in charge at Lysus, uh, he's a Pompeian um, naval captain, set up some longboats and small crafts and prepared to board them. At the same time, he began negotiating for their surrender, so wanting the Caesareans to surrender to him, promising safety, to, promising safety to those who had surrendered. So the deal is, surrender to me, and you'll be fine, nothing will happen to you. <coughs> After receiving a sworn guarantee that the enemy would not harm them, they surrendered. You think, okay, sounds like a good, good deal, I'll surrender to you. Um, all of them were brought before him and a violation of the sanctity of the oath killed with extreme cruelty in his sight. Now this is Caesar presenting his opponents and the treatment of Caesar's soldiers and sailors. Um, but this is Caesar contrasting his approach, which is, I release you safely, look at the horrible things my opponents are doing. And the reason I want to highlight this to you is because um, the, the Latin that we'll see in Suetonius refers to these people as those who have surrendered, and that's their kind of status. Can I have the next slide? We'll go back to the Suetonius. So what I think is perhaps for either Suetonius' readers or a contemporary audience who might have been told this story. What I think is particularly damning to Augustus is the idea that these people were surrendered. And this is presenting him acting in complete opposition to what Caesar would have done. Um, so we might sort of see how it is possible to view this as a construction or a, a piece of propaganda disseminated by the opponents, perhaps out of um, <coughs> some treatment of, of the enemy after Caesar's seizure. That's great, thank you, yes. And as I said, the flip side of this is um, Augustus being presented as the epitome of clemency and forgiveness. Um, this comes from a funerary inscription called the so-called Laudatio Curia. <laughs> so it's a, it's a husband mourning his wife, and he praises her for all that she's done for them and for him, particularly during the civil wars. Um, now, it's worth pointing out that he talks about, thanks to the favourable decision of Caesar Augustus, this means that we can definitely date this inscription to after he gets the name Augustus, and that is after the Civil War. So this is a sort of an Augustan era inscription, once he has come to power and ends the Civil War. So it's perhaps not surprising that he's presented in a favourable manner. But effectively, he, um, he places the blame for cruelty against himself and against his wife uh, at the feet of Lepidus. Uh, Augustus's colleague. 
Thanks to the favourable decision of Caesar Augustus, then away from Rome, I was restored as a citizen of our country. You then confronted his colleague, Marcus Lepidus, who was in charge of Rome, this is the husband speaking to his deceased wife, about my reinstatement. So the wife has gone to petition Lepidus, saying, please, let my husband come home. Augustus has said it's okay. Well, sorry, Caesar has said it's okay. Prostrate on the ground before his feet, not only were you lifted up, you were also dragged away and carried off like a slave. So we have a Roman citizen woman being physically sort of manhandled, woman handled, um, on the orders of Lepidus. What could have been more effective than this courage of yours to offer Caesar an opportunity for clemency while preserving my life, to brand the ruthless cruelty of Lepidus through your own exceptional willingness to endure hardship? And this document is fascinating from the point of view of female agency in general and, and the presentation of a marriage at this particular period in, of civil war. Um, but it's interesting to see how Augustus is being praised for his clemency and Lepidus, who is still alive potentially at this point in time, or perhaps dead, but removed certainly from political activity, is being, it has become the scapegoat in terms of violence towards Roman citizens at Rome. Can I have the next slide? So I've been referring to him mainly as Augustus, but also wanting us to think about sort of the complexity of his various presentations and personae. So yes, what's in a name? Can I have the next slide? That's what might be the next. Oh yes, Augustus, his dates, um, 20, 23rd of September 63 BC to the 19th of August AD 14. Next slide. Okay, so I just want to say a little bit about Roman naming practices, because I do think it is relevant and interesting when we look at the evolution of Augustus's names. Um, if you are a Roman male citizen, it's another story for women, um, surprise, surprise, patriarchal society, um, but by the time of the late Republic, the majority of Roman male citizens will have three names. It is not always the case, as we'll see with Mark Antony, but it's kind of the standard practice. You have a prinomen, so your first name, so Marcus, Gaius, Gnaeus. You have the Gentilicium, which is your family name, the Gens. Uh, so Tullius, Julius, Pompeius, um, Antonius. Um, you can have a patronymic, which is who your father is. And normally with Roman naming practices, as you see in inscriptions, it will say son of and then give your father's first name because the understanding is you have the same family name. And then you have the cognomen, uh, a surname, effectively. So we have Marcus, Tullius, son of Marcus, Cicero, uh, Gaius Julius, Caesar, Gnaeus Pompeius, Magnus, uh, and then we have Mark Antony, <laughs> Marcus Antonius. But that's kind of the standard practice. And when we look at uh, Augustus's name at birth that we know from our sources, he is Gaius Octavius. He may have had a cognomen, but the sources are unclear. Um, if you read Suetonius, it might have been Furinus. If you read Diocassius, it might be Caipius. But we have no you know, evidence besides those sources. Of <coughs> However, things start to change for him in 44 BC when, on the 15th of March, what happened? The Ides of March. Julius Caesar got stabbed many, many times by his colleagues. So the, the assassination of Julius Caesar, who was Gaius Octavius's great uncle <coughs> and in caesar's will when it's finally disclosed he names his young great nephew guys octavius as one of his heirs to inherit his estate his fortune um, and in order to do that he kind of has to legally become his son and take on his name so when he accepts his inheritance from caesar he legally or formally becomes gaius julius caesar and then octavianus which is derived from his original uh, family name, Octavius, and an A and an N have been added at the end, uh, between the I and the US, uh, to sort of signify original family, but he's now been adopted to another family. And this is where we, why we often call him Octavian. It's, it's a sort of shortening of Octavianus. And the only reason we call him that, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is that otherwise we're gonna get him confused with the other Caesar. Most of the sources after this point start to refer to him as Caesar. So when you're reading uh, the histories, you've got to be sort of clear of what year it is. We are either referring to Julius Caesar the dictator, or either referring to Caesar who will become Augustus. 
So for convenience, we call him Octavian, but that's not necessarily a name he himself wanted to use. Have the next slide, please. Yes, love it. So, case in point, we have a letter, letter from Cicero, so Roman politician and orator, who at this point is still alive, um, about a month after the assassination of Julius Caesar. And he's writing to his friend Atticus about young Gaius Octavius, who is Caesar's heir. And he says, Octavius is here with us, so he's visiting Cicero, acting most honourably and loyally. His own people have been saluting him as Caesar. Philippus does not. Philippus was uh, young Caesar, Caesar's uh, stepfather. Philippus does not, so neither do I. I do not think that anyone who does can be a good citizen. Cicero, I think, is in part concerned with having another Caesar after one has just been removed and all that entails. Um, his own people, so the people gathered around uh, the young man as, as Caesar's heir, who have an interest in him becoming Caesar, have started to call him Caesar. But his stepfather doesn't. He's still calling him Octavius by his original name. So there's that tension there in his identity. Next slide, please. Don't be put off by this horrible table. Um, I, I did this over the summer when I was trying to track in Cicero's letters when he's called Octavius, when he's called Caesar. And it's not, I, I only put this here as an illustration of that it's not entirely a linear development from being Octavius to being Caesar. Uh, again, Kathy will have the slides, should you want to look at this. What I wanted to illustrate with this, with the slight colour coding, is Octavius, 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 then he starts to be called Octavianus by Cicero, which starts to, Cicero is acknowledging his inheritance, now acknowledging him as the heir of Caesar, whereas before he didn't. He starts to call him Caesar Octavianus, um, then even young Caesar. Um, and in part it depends who he's writing to, because having called him Caesar and young Caesar, then writing to Tyro, his secretary, he refers back to calling him Octavius. So he's sort of, it might depend on who he's talking to. Um, and then um, we can see from the end of 44 and beginning of January, Cicero starts to call him Caesar a lot more, particularly when he's writing to Caesarians, so supporters of, of Caesar, deceased. Um, and, uh, but interestingly, Pollio, um, so he gets called Caesar mainly at, from the end of, uh, well, 43. But we have a letter from the middle of 43 where Asinius Pollio is writing to Cicero. Asinius Pollio was a supporter of Antony. First of Caesar, then of Antony. And, and he is referring to him as Octavianus. So he's acknowledging the inheritance, but he's not calling him Caesar. He's kind of using this, uh, you know, his earlier name. He's not, he doesn't want to acknowledge him as Caesar. So then, there's an interesting sort of game of foot as to what people are calling him, how far they're acknowledging his position. Can I have the next slide, please? And I click again, sorry. <laughs> yes, so just to emphasize the fact that for young Octavian, uh, let's call him young Caesar, um, a colleague of mine, Catherine Walsh, who's um, an Australian um, Cicero historian, has for many years now insisted that we call him young Caesar, not Octavian, because that's what he's calling himself, or he's calling himself Caesar. And here is the evidence in one coin, minted in 42, where he is Gaius Caesar, Imperator, as a, a title awarded to a victorious general after the name, as a suffix, you put it at the end of the name, uh, triumvir for the settlement of the Roman state, or the restoration of the state. So this is how he's promoting himself on, as it were, official um, well, coinage. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, Battle of Perugia, which you've already heard about in relation to that possible sacrifice of 300 on an altar. Um, this was siege warfare. So we have evidence of the bullets being flung by both sides. Here we have a line drawing of a bullet that has on it Gaius, oh sorry, um, Caesar, Kaiser Imp, Caesar Imperator, Caesar Victorious General. Um, this is the name he used, and you know, we interpret this as a bullet being flung by his troops. Uh, because we have plenty of bullets from uh, this conflict and other conflicts where you put the name of the commanding officer uh, on, on the bullet. We have, this is a, a photograph of, this, of a different sling bullet, two photographs of the same bullet, and you can see how big it is. Um, it's about, um, what is it, it's, it's, it's lead, it's about two ounces, so 70 grams. 
which may not seem very heavy, but when it's being flung at speed, that can do some serious damage. This is from the Ashmolean Museum, and for years it was in a display case saying a bullet, the sling bullet of Octavian. Because it does say, and it might be quite hard to make it out, it's got O, C, T, A, B, C, and I. So it does say Octavian or Octavius or Octavie on it. So an easy assumption going, oh, it's got his name on it, it's being flung by his troops. However, we've already seen that he prefers to be called Caesar. Um, and actually, when I was working with um, Alison Cooley uh, on an inscriptions project based at the Ashmolean Museum, and we were able to get our hands on the bullet and realize that it had writing on the other side as well. Um, it is a message to him, uh, telling him to do something. Well, I'll have to check with Kathy whether or not we can actually talk about what he was asked to do. Uh, if you want to know, there's an excellent podcast on this bullet that you can find online with Alison Cooley. Mary Cooley-Mead in a SP Yes, did you talk about very rude things? This is one of the very, very rude bullets, asking him to perform a particular sexual act. Uh, and it's signed by the 10th Equestrian Legion, which is an Antonian Legion. And they are deliberately calling him Octavius because they're not acknowledging him as Caesar. Um, that's only one of the reasons why it's an interesting piece of evidence. <laughs> Just in the interests of fairness, his side were writing very deep things Absolutely. against the other yes. side. Well. Both sides were quite literally hurling insults at each other. Um, and actually, interestingly, this, this is one of the few instances where we have Fulvia so Mark Antony's wife also named on a bullet. The bullet is seeking out a particular part of her anatomy. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. <laughs> Can you tell me where Florence is? Yeah, it's it, 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 Italy. It, yes. Which part of Italy? It is in northern part, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I don't remember um, So we go back to his name. Um, he's become Caesar for all intents and purposes, and let his opponents wanting to belittle him by calling him Octavius. Then in 42, he gets to sort of, um, to improve his name still further, because Julius Caesar is now deified. We have a temple erected to him, he becomes a god. Uh, and so rather than calling himself son of Gaius, he can call himself son of, of the divine, Phileus, a divi Phileus. Uh, next slide. So he, yeah, he, and no one else can claim to be the son of a god in quite such an explicit way. Um, I apologise for the quality of this image. Um, it comes from a long uh, inscription found in the Roman Forum that lists the triumphs awarded to Roman generals, supposedly from Romulus uh, down to 19 BC. And this is what I put a black box around is the entry for 40 BC, where both and he's calling himself here Imperator Caesar, son of the divine, uh, son of Gaius, triumvir for the restoration of the race publica, celebrated an ovation, which is a mini triumph, um, because he made peace with Marcus Antonius. And we have exactly the same entry for Mark Antony, Marcus Antonius, son of Marcus, grandson of Marcus, uh, triumvir for the restoration of the Roman state, for the race publica, celebrated an ovation in Forty because he made peace with Imperator Caesar. The inscription actually dates from the Augustan period, uh, at least 19 BC or later. Um, but here we can see him both referring to himself as being the son of a god or a deified individual, but also his name has changed here as well, Imperator or Caesar. Uh, next slide. Yeah, a coin illustrating this, this, this same, same fact. This is actually a temple to the deified Julius Caesar. We have a nice little sort of... Uh, inscription or label on the entablature of the table um, and he is re now referring to himself as Imperator Caesar, son of the divine. Uh, next slide. Just question, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Star on top, like Ab yes, well spotted. In the pediment there is the star which is the, the comic, exactly, the apotheosis, the deification of Caesar. Very well spotted indeed. Um, so yes, um, he's, he's now changed his name from being Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus to being Imperator which is the Latin for victorious general, holder of imperium. And um, previously, people would have it at the end of their name. You know, you'd have uh, Gaius Julius Caesar Imperator, Pompeius Magnus Imperator, even, believe it or not, Marcus Tullius Cicero Imperator. Um, but what he, what he does, which is again unique, is he takes that title, that honorific title at the end of the name, and he puts it at the beginning of his name. So his first name now is Imperator. <laughs> Um, I can't imagine people going around going, hey, Imperator, what are you up to? You know, um, but his first, so his name is now perpetually associated with the idea of victory and military power. 
And here's an example of this, and also coming back to the idea of the race publica that we were talking about and thinking about the triumvirate in this respect. The Roman Senate and the people dedicate a building that we no longer have, or a monument we no longer have, to Imperator Caesar, son of the dead by Julius, consul for the fifth time, consul designate for the sixth time, Imperator for the seventh time, the state having been preserved. This seems to be the Senate and the people in 29 buying into the idea that he has indeed restored the res publica, whatever that means in reality. Next slide. I might have to rush through these so we can get to, uh, get to your questions. Um, and this is just further emphasised in a number of monuments. Those of you who have just started doing the imperial image, I understand you've got as far as Actium. And this is a reconstruction of the victory monument at Actium or at Nicopolis along with the, the monumental inscription in Latin as it remains to us, and this is just the restoration. Imperator Caesar, son of the death by Julius, victor in the, in the Actian War, which he waged on behalf of the Republic. So he's claiming that he was fighting this war uh, because of the Res Publica. And then he also claims that he achieved peace by land and sea in this monument. Oh, next slide. Um, so yes, we've got down to 38, he becomes... Imperator as his first name, and then click. Yeah, and then 27 BCE is when, as we've seen going back to uh, chapter 34 of the Rose Gesta, he is given this new honorific name that no one's had before. He becomes Augustus. So his name is now Imperator Caesar Divi Filius Augustus. Next, next slide. Um, and again, we go back to chapter 34 where he makes his claim as a recognition for his extraordinary achievement, that he's given the name Augustus, and he's variously honoured uh, with laurels uh, that stand either side of his door. The civic crown, the oak wreath, is nailed above his, uh, his, his door, and there is a shield in the Senate, a golden shield, that recognises his achievements on behalf of the Roman state, for his bravery, clemency, justice, and duty. Next slide. Sorry, I'll get to this one really interesting thing about Augustus's new name is how it is presented in Greek. Augustus is his name in Latin, um, but we're told here by Cassius Dio uh, um, that um, normally when you have a Latin name and it's written in Greek, it is transliterated. So they spell out the Latin in the Greek alphabet, so when you pronounce it, it sounds the sort of same. Um, but with the name Augustus, they don't transliterate it, they translate it. So in the Greek, he is Sebastos, which means the same thing as Augustus. So Dyer says, therefore, they addressed him in Greek also as Sebastos, meaning an august person from the passive verb sabazo to revere. So they're not transliterating. It's really important that they communicate what the name means to this audience. Uh, click, please. I think I have just one example. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, so here is an example of a Greek inscription, this is a Greek inscription of Greek, from the people of Caesarea Marina, uh, where they refer to him as Sebastos, Augustus, and they also are dedicating this monument to, in the Greek it's uh, Arene Sebaste, but that means Augustan peace. So that's Pax Augusta, but in Greek. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, but just interesting, oh, yeah. he was keen to be called Romulus until he got the idea that... Well, we have this next slide, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is a really good point. When they're deciding, oh my God, he, he saved the state, he's ended civil war, we have to honour him somehow, what can we call him? One of the names indeed in the, in the running was Romulus, because Romulus was the founder of Rome. And Augustus, you know, might be see you guys are here, a second founder of the city, let's call him Romulus, that's a great idea. And then it's like, oh, there... Romulus, if you don't know, is a problematic history. If you read the beginning of Livy's first book, uh, the stories about him are very mixed and varied. You know, guilty of fratricide. Uh, was he taken up in a pillar of smoke to become a god? Or was he torn apart by the senators? <laughs> so, uh, either way, not a look that Augustus really wanted to go with. So, this proposal of calling him a completely new, new name that no one's ever had before, Augustus. And Suetonius here talks about what Augustus might mean and its derivations in, in Latin. And he quotes Ennius, who is a, um, a Latin epic poet um, earlier, earlier, earlier than Virgil. Um, and uh, quoting one line, after by aug augury august, illustrious Rome has been founded. So he's taking this line from Ennius, 
which is about the founding of Rome, tying it into augury, which is one of Rome's religious practices, the observation of birds, and trying to link that to the name Augustus to sort of make it all nicely fit together. Uh, next slide, please. All the drawings at the end. Oh, okay. Um, I won't go through this slide in detail. It's from Valerius Paterculus, who was writing under Tiberius, and he's kind of summing up Augustus' achievements. He says, Civil wars were concluded in the 20th year, external wars were dead and buried, peace was recalled, and everywhere the furor of arms was lulled to sleep. So he's talking about how everything is now wonderful, Augustus has restored everything. And he goes on to say, that former, Prisca, and ancient form of the race publica was recalled. So he has this idea that Augustus has ended civil wars after 20 years of civil war. And that somehow we've gone back to an earlier, more ancient, original form of the race publica. And he lists all the various ways in which you might see that return to a prior, a prior, a prior setting. Cultivation in the fields, respect for sacred places, to purity, laws, order, all apparently good things. Next slide. Finally, I just want to think about Augustus's position in the state in relation to the race publica and how that is then um, setting up what we call the principate or, or the empire, but this rule of one individual, or one individual who is the leader of the state. So in Suetonius, he, he quotes Augustus, may it be my privilege to establish the state, the race publica, in a firm and secure position and reap from that act the fruit that I desire but only if I may be called the author of the best possible government, um, the best possible status. And bear with me the hope that when I die, that the foundations which I have laid for the state, the foundations of the race publica, will remain unshaken. But Suetonius goes on to say, he realised his hope by making every effort to prevent any dissatisfaction with the new regime, the Nove Status. So he's acknowledging that what is creating is new. Uh, but Augustus is arguing this is the best form for the state to survive. Um, at the bottom is a passage from Aulus Gellius, which is again a quotation of Augustus writing to his grandson Gaius. I pray the gods, whatever time is left to me, I may pass with you safe and well, with our country in a flourishing condition. And um, he talks about the state, um, the, the race publica flourishing. Um, while you both, because he's talking about both Gaius and Lucius, his two grandsons and adopted sons, are playing the man and preparing to succeed my position, whatever that, that really meant. Um, next slide, please. We are almost at the end, I promise. <laughs> Didn't they die shortly they, after? Yeah, if, yes, unfortunately, all his hopes placed in his two sons, and they both died young, so he had to look for alternatives, one of whom is his stepson Tiberius. This is a, an extract from a decree of the Senate under Tiberius as emperor. It is a senatorial decree concerning uh, Piso. Uh, senior who was uh, charged with treason and mut mutiny and treason and possibly the assassination of Germanicus uh, who was Caesar's nephew and adopted son sorry Tiberius's nephew and adopted son but this is just an interesting extract for again kind of the solidifying of the relationship of the princeps the leader the head of the state with the idea of the security of the race publica that the senate and the people of Rome give thanks above all to the immortal gods because they did not allow the tranquility of the current state of affairs in the Republic, so the Status Republicae, something better than which is not possible to desire and which has fallen to our lot to enjoy, thanks to the beneficence of our princeps, of our leader, uh, which is Tiberius at this time. Next slide. It should be the last one. Yes. Just to sort of track this even further to the end of the Julio-Claudian period, which is begun by Augustus and ends with Nero. This is an extract from Seneca's work on Mercy de Clementia, which he was writing to a young Nero when Nero became Frinkex, when he became emperor. And he writes, the emperor is the bond, the vinculum, by which the commonwealth, by which the res publica, is united, the breath of life, which these many thousands draw, who in their own strength would be only a burden to themselves and prey of others. If the great mind of empire should be withdrawn. And here he's equating that great mind with the princeps. So if we lose the princeps, we lose the bond that binds the state together and we lose the impetus of our empire. Next slide. Yes. 
So that is just a sort of uh, some thoughts. I can go on forever on this topic, I promise you, about how we go from young Caesar to Augustus and that relationship of Augustus to the Rose Publica and Rose. And I understand, Kathy, that there are several questions. <laughs> So one of the things I've got to say before um, we do the questions is uh, uh, this is being streamed live, so it's your chance to be a sort of sub TikTok star or whatever. Um, so you know, do, do be aware of that fact. Also, I'd say that this talk and you know, thank you very much, Hannah, for that. There's lots of things about. I'm going to talk similar to this in about months so or lots for me to steal. Um, will be dumped on the association's YouTube channel. There's other stuff out there as well. So please do uh, have a look at all of that. Um, if um, you're enthused about the Romans, and let's face it, who isn't? Um, another thing to think about locally um, is that this coming Saturday at 12 noon at the Avedale Heritage Centre, just to across the road in Castle, We've got a chap called Barry Collinson, and Barry will be talking about the Romans in Newcastle under Lyme um, in front of a collection of material he's put in the Eightdale Heritage Museum there. So if you're interested about the Romans in a more local um, guise, so to speak, and we can connect them together because people urged the Emperor Augustus to invade Britain. They never got round to it, but nonetheless, <laughs> they, they did urge him to do that. Um, so please do come along to that. Somewhere there's a little boot going around as well. Um, if you put your name, and in particular if you put your email address down on there, um, you can go onto our mailing system and we will fire you bits about things classical and so on and so forth. So you know, again, if you're interested, please do consider doing that. We've got a whole programme this coming year. That's out there as well, so do have a look at that. But now, Copies of it here. As, as long as you're oh, happy to be a TikTok star, uh, please do. I'll hand over to Cathy and, and uh, please do ask some questions. Just before Cathy speaks, uh, Hannah mentioned peace in her talk. And just to say, on our YouTube channel, you can find Ka Hannah already talking to this branch about Roman peace, if you want to add to what you've learned today. Right, we've got um, a range of questions. Rebecca, would you like to start off? And we'll try and get as many of you in as possible. If, if you were possibly able in some alternate universe to go back, what would you ask Augustus? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, hmm. Very good question. It just depends on what point I landed back in time. Am I talking to Augustus? Am I talking to young Caesar? Is it at the end of his life when he's finalising? Let's go to guess young I'm... Octavius. Mm. So it's, it's interesting in, in Cicero's letters and some of the histories where he's not necessarily tentative, but his decision to sort of accept his inheritance under Caesar seems to be a sort of a point of some concern amongst his family uh, for his own security, basically. You know, if you become Caesar's heir, you've got a target on your back. Um, and so I, I suppose I'd be interested in asking or trying to find out from such a young, a young man um, why. Um, I personally, though, I'd be more curious to speak to Livia. You know, uh, <laughs> if we accept that she's the power behind the throne in various aspects, um, and why she decided to, you know, shack up with him is perhaps the wrong word, but you know. <laughs> Leave her husband when she's like sort of, you know, eight months pregnant and 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 and, and join uh, join with a uh, with a bastard. Um, so yeah. Uh, what would you ask him? Um I'll take Livia's place. Um, <laughs> 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 um, he, might, he, he might ask, what are you bring to the table? You know, what's the <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's that you haven't discussed in the PowerPoint, but it's about his infidelity. So, <laughs> not, do you think, what do you think the Romans would say about his infidelity? But also, I want to add that there's two points we should focus on. As a result of his infidelity, he did get some useful information from the women he saw, mm -hmm. were like married to other politicians and stuff. But there's also the point of him, him portraying himself as like a yeah. pet. Take a patriarch, yeah. where he did laws about marriage and you're not supposed to cheat or anything. Well, those laws are interesting because, yes, he certainly wants to regulate socially and legally activities in marriage and activities in the bedroom. In, uh, uh, they are particularly um, harsh on women. 
less well known. Interesting. And we know that he is very adamant in enforcing those laws when it comes to his, his daughter and granddaughter. Yeah. But yes, that is so conflicting with what we're also told in Suetonius about, you know, from the letter of Antony. Again, we might think of the context that this is not to say he wasn't doing this, because, you know, they all seem to be bed hopping at some point or another. But, but yes, it certainly is a contradiction with that image that he cultivates. And that letter comes from Antony at a time when obviously Antony is still alive. And Caesar, Augustus, young Caesar, has evidently written to Antony going, what are you doing with this Egyptian queen? You're married to my sister. <laughs> What are you doing, mate? And he's like, what does it matter? I've been in this relationship with this woman, Cleopatra, for nine years. Um, and, you know, you're, you're not loyal to your wife. You're bed hopping for whatever reason, whether it's for intel or just enjoyment. And we have other sources that allude to Livia sort of, you know, procuring young women for him, him to the flower. But we also have in, in, in Suetonius' life of Augustus and then also Caesar, lots of instances of, whether they're invective or uh, attacks or defamation against Caesar and Augustus for their sexual activities, whether it's with women or whether it's with men. But what about when Suetonius said that uh, Augustus did sexual favors for Caesar to, you know, get a doctor by him? Yeah, apparently sort of set, well also there's that selling his virginity to Hertius for, was it 300,000 or 200,000 sesterces? Um, Caesar is equally sort of accused, Mark Anthony, they're all accused of, and so part of it is, again, like I say, they're, evidently these are things we assume that people are doing, but it's about that sort of presentation, um, and particularly with him, sexual favours to Caesar to, to get adopted, and again, that needs to be seen in the context of the conflict between Anthony and young Caesar for who is Caesar's heir, um, but also that it's about putting yourself into a sort of passive position. Um, it's... Being in a homosexual relationship is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're being penetrated as a man, that's where it becomes problematic for the Romans. So some of those sling bullets from Perugia are also about the issue of penetration and depending on the position. So it's sort of complex thing because the Romans' idea of morality and sexuality are not the same as ours, but they clearly have a set of, of mores and standards that at least how you're formally perceived as, particularly, you know, once Augustus is taking particular stances, although the legislation on adultery and marriage occurs once he is Augustus and Trinquettes versus the letters of Antony and the accusations from when he's a young man. So perhaps it's a benefit to getting a new name and changing your persona. And when all your opponents are dead, you can't really question. And yet there is this record that Suetonius has access to. So... Yeah, no, it's, it's a very complicated, sort of messy area of, of what he's doing and what others are doing and how they're perceiving and presenting him as a result. And what we get in Suetonius is a kind of an amalgamation from different points in his life about why, what he's doing, but then how that's being used against him um, and how he's used it against other people. Um, so, yes, sorry, that doesn't really answer your question, but I hope it gives you a little more to think about. Thank you very much. Okay, Cable, you've got a question? Um, what's, your, what's your personal view on the prescriptions? I, not a good thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous. There are these two points in the Roman Republic, one under Sulla and one under the Triumvirs, where your name's on a list and you're forfeit. You know? And we read about what happens to Cicero and we go, that's horrendous. Cicero is just one case, although he suffers particularly brutally, or at least his remains do, uh, because of personal anim animosities. But it's, it's a really, really sort of brutal period. Um, whether you read the prescriptions that happen under Sulla or whether you read the ones that happen under the Triumvirate, and if you read Appian, it's just, it's episode after episode of individual lives that are being destroyed. Um, and it, it's really interesting in terms of the impact that the prescriptions of the Civil War has on social life and family relations and whether you uh, protect your family, and that includes slaves and freedmen uh, within the family, or whether you're, you know, you're going to rat someone out for your own benefit or your own safety. So the prescriptions, no, terrible, horrible. Um, a very bad idea in many respects, although uh, the argument being made, I guess, for them, if there is an argument for them, is that this is about removing instability in the state, removing opponents, uh, but it's also lining the, the coffers the financing um, of, of the regime. I mean, Sulla does it when he's dictator, and he is the appointed dictator 
on very similar terms to the triumvirs in order to restore the state. Uh, so, but he's doing it to you know remove dissidents and and, and gain money. Um, as the triumvirs are doing. I mean, they're fighting a war against Brutus and Cassius and other people. The finances of that war are ridiculous. The amount of money both sides are having to extract, whether from citizens or subject communities, is vast. Um, so no one really wins apart from a couple of people. Yeah, thank you. That is an excellent question. I wish I knew because it would seem nigh on impossible uh, in exile to continue as head of Roman religion where you kind of need to be at Rome. And it's very interesting that you know, Augustus claims to only take on that role once Lepidus has actually died. So it's really interesting theory where Rome doesn't have a, have a complex maximus or that he, they have one that he's in exile um, from 36 to 12 BC. Rome has other colleges uh, and other priests which can oversee Roman religion, but no, I don't think there's any way that he, he could officially serve as one of the um, whilst, whilst in exile. Um, but it, it's interesting insight into how Augustus is presenting himself. Uh, he doesn't take on that office until Lepidus has died, until the previous Pontius Maximus has died, because it is an office that will for life. So he's presenting himself as being you know, very constitutional and proper whilst also holding lots of other religious offices and just waiting until you go, ah, oh, well, now he's dead. I would, of course, generously take on that role and lead you as, you know, your sort of religious father. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I can only imagine what Lepidus uh, was, was trying to do in exile or, or you know, whether he gave any thought to the fact that I'm in exile, I can no longer serve as Pontifex Maximus. Maybe, maybe he was really... Uh, but it's an interesting question to think about. Thank you. This is more in speaking of assassination. Yeah. Do you believe that there's a capacity to write and what we live in and any more high ground at all? So that's a very interesting question. Um, and there's been quite a bit written on the philosophical approaches or their philosophical education that would have led him to believe that tyrannicide was justified. Um, and there's an interesting letter to Cicero. Um, from around the time, he's writing to Matthias, who is a personal friend of Cicero. These are Cicero's letters to friends, book 11, letters 27, 28. One is Cicero to Matthias, one is Matthias to Cicero. Um, and Cicero is sort of saying that, and of course he's writing after Caesar's been assassinated, so he can kind of justify it in hindsight. He said, if Caesar was a king, if he was a rex, as I think he was, then he deserves what he got. Because, however, because Matthias wasn't a political, a public figure, he was a personal or a private individual, a personal friend of Caesar. And he is kind of being, Caesar is writing to him because Matthias has, has been arguing against the assassination, saying it's not right, you killed an individual, that's a bad thing. Um, and so Cicero writes to him sort of saying, I understand that you know, the loss of your friend was a terrible thing, but if we think that he was a tyrant and a king, then his, his death is necessary for the small argument for him, you know, from harm, but the, the act hasn't been done. Cicero's argument is that you should value the safety of the Roman state over the life of your individual friend. Um, so yeah, so whether or not they were justified in killing him, it didn't do them any favours, it didn't get them the results they wanted. Um, and you see in the, in, in the empire as well, sort of various assassinations, uh, the assassination of Gaius Caligula, um, at least in Josephus' account, so he's writing on history where he gives an account of the assassination and references made back to Bruce and Cassius and how they, they didn't save the state, they kind of destroyed it. But now we've destroyed this tyrant, yes, we've got freedom and liberty or we can return the state. And then he was So, it's, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, it's interesting to think about um, the, the philosophy and the, the mental framework within which they, they see this as the only course of action uh, to remove someone that they perceive as dangerous. And you look at the, the coinage that Bruce and Cassie have made a couple of years later in their own use, and there's the incredibly famous Eyes of March coin. I don't know if you've, you've seen it or not, but it has Brutus's portrait on one side, and on the other side there are two daggers, a little um, a freedman's cap of Peleus, which looks a bit like a, a pudding bowl, and then underneath it says in Latin, Eyes of March. 
Um, and this coin's being minted by Brutus to pay his troops who are fighting against <laughs> young Caesar and Antony, um, but to justify what he's doing in the name of liberty. It's, it's justifying killing a tyrant to bring liberty to the Roman state. And liberty is a really important concept for the Romans in relation to, to the Republic. So, yeah, I think they, they clearly had arguments to justify it, um, but again, it's a moral gray area, really. Why did Octavian spare Mark Antony to attack his children? Um, no, really interesting question because Caesarian is <coughs> dead, uh, old enough potentially to challenge, uh, and being Caesar's heir, very traumatic for Octavian. Um, Alexandra, um, Helios, and Cleopatra Savini much smaller. And yes, we know that they were sort of taken into Octavia's household, they were raised in the imperial family, they become part of almost the imperial machine, Cleopatra Salini getting married to Juba II of Mauritania and kind of, you know, helping to propagate a, a network um, of empire in the Mediterranean. I think because they were young enough not to be a threat and also killing really young children is problematic, I think. Uh, but then there's also, it allows him to sort of promote himself as um, taking these children into the, into the family household. Um, so I, th I think, I think effectively they weren't a threat in the same way that Caesarian was, and then that they could become useful as they grew up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that anyone Yeah. So yeah, the, the whole issue around sort of yes, the legal adoption is, is I was reading about this over the summer actually, so it's, it's a little bit tricky and complicated, but because he was named as um, one of Caesar's heirs, and there are multiple heirs and there are different things, you're an heir in the first degree, second and third. Um, but yeah, so he wasn't in the will as, as far as I, I can understand, actually named as I want him to be adopted. But in order to receive the inheritance he had to sort of legally transfer his status. Um, in terms of the tampering, I mean, yes, the wills are meant to be sealed and in the possession of, of the best will. And, and likewise, there's always the question of a Mark Antony as well. So does he the first degree? Yes, yeah. Him and one other, other, other individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark Antony's will is probably mm -hmm. a more of a question mark over because uh, Augustus young Caesar takes it, reads it privately, and then reads it before the Senate, which is about Mark Antony wanting to be buried in Egypt with Cleopatra and not wanting to. So the, there's a big question mark over, is that really what it said, or are you just using it to you know, your own advantage? Um, yeah, so again, it, it, it's, it's hard to tell, really. Um, uh, but it's not implausible at all that Caesar was looking to, as someone who was a blood relation, even if you know, not, not directly related to pass on his name and estate to those individuals. So it's kind of hands going up now. Sorry? Um, I'll just say maybe a little bit then. Yeah. 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 Um, so, no, it's interesting when we look at um, Augustus and then the later emperors in terms of their presentation in, in Egypt, um, that they effectively take on the position as, as the pharaoh um, in, in those various presentations. There are some, some reliefs. I think one is actually of, it might be like a Trajan from Dendera. And the only way, way I could personally tell it's Trajan is the fact that it, the cartouche says it's Trajan, otherwise it doesn't look anything like him based on his other portraiture. So there's something interesting there about sort of inserting yourself into pre-existing power structures and what does, you know, because Augustus, as I say, is, is, is Pharaoh in all but name. And there's an inscription from, a trilingual inscription from the island of Philae, which is above the first catholic of the Nile, which is in hieroglyphics, um, then Latin and Greek and Latin. Um, and in, in the, the hieroglyphic text is very different from the Latin and Greek, which are, are far more similar. and refer to him as, as you know, Imperator Caesar. Or, um, uh, but in the um, hieroglyphic text, he's, he's effectively referred to as Pharaoh, may he live forever. 
So it's a very different sort of framing uh, within power structures that are going to be sort of comprehensible and familiar in that landscape. Um, and it's not dissimilar to how he's presented in, in the Eastern Mediterranean in terms of Hellenistic ruler cult, and that it's okay to, to worship him as a god in that context, whereas that's not what happens in Rome or Italy until after he's dead. So I think that presentation is dependent on um, the context, um, particularly in terms of pre-existing power structures, if that makes sense. Thank you. I think there was a question. Why do you think the activists <laughs> yeah, he kind of, he, he starts off as actually incredibly important, um, particularly in sort of 44 and 43, um, him and Mark Antony sort of working together, and then he just sort of seems to just fall by the wayside, um, and I don't, yeah, I don't sort of have any sort of strong indication or understanding of why that is, besides the fact that it, it starts to become this power struggle between you know, Antony and young Caesar, um, both as the potential heirs of Caesar, and then because of the capital that young Caesar has as Caesar's heir, and drawing on Caesar's clients and the troops. Um, and, and Lepidus doesn't necessarily have that with Antony sort of in, in, in the East. Uh, I don't know, Andrew, if you've got any strong thoughts on, on no, Lepidus. No, well, I think very briefly, but he ain't got soldiers. I mean, that's how he's eventually yeah. marginalised, isn't he? Yeah, and you know, it, it, the number of troops in the field at this time are sort of vast. Um, you know, when Augustus is the last man left standing, there is there are like what's the rest of it? 40, 40 plus legions in the field, and he has to reduce it to 28 and then only 25 just because it's too many. Um, troops to try and pay, handle, manage, um, so that becomes what might be referred to as a, an, an economy of empire, only having a certain number of legions in the field at areas in the empire where you feel you most need them. I think maybe Hannah, the, the nice thing that the people is given, who points out yeah. that Louis the Fourteenth's army was bigger <laughs> from just one part of the Roman Empire than the whole Roman Empire ever had an army. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is an economy of soldiers. Yeah, there really is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also drawing on um, auxiliaries and try to, not trying to be friendly kings, and then far more expecting sort of provinces to also see to their own defences in certain respects. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Lepidus not being able to, to match the clout that both um, young Caesar, Caesar and Anthony now. Yeah. Right. Do you think that young Caesar overacting is important for the comic for Caesar's accomplices? Yeah, it worked well for him, right? I mean, I suppose it worked. Did he overemphasize it? No. No, there was a I No, I think it worked out you know, well for him. And um, when you see a comet that aligns with you know, the, the funeral games for the previous leader, you wonder it. You know, these, these are sort of relevant and important signs. Um, and he certainly capitalises on it. Um, although, as his career goes on, it, it becomes less about being the son of a god, and more about his own sort of, you know, self Um Caesar and his deification are very important in the late 40s and in the Triangle period before he establishes himself as, you know, as the new Caesar, as, as Augustus. Right, has everyone had their chance? Have we missed anybody out who had a question? Even non-students. <laughs> yeah. We read through um, Roman history that some of the emperors were good and bad. Uh, yeah. With Octavian becoming the first Roman Emperor, mm -hmm. Roman Emperor, will he go down in history as being a good <laughs> Roman Emperor or a bad Roman Emperor? Yeah, he's, he's certainly seen within the context of by Romans themselves as the model that you want to follow. Right? There's the the, the well-known um, expression that, uh, was it from the second century, third century, when emperors are coming to power, they're told, may you be uh, more fortunate than Augustus and better than Trajan. So these are the two ones that are perceived from Trajan onwards as being kind of like the best emperors to be. Um, and well, Trajan have a vote. Yeah, maybe that's it, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, he's, he, he is the, the emperor on which they all model themselves because 
I mean, he had an incredibly long, long life and long career that was, for the most part, uninterrupted. There were a couple of internal issues and things, but um, he, he creates the model that they basically follow. So he is kind of the, the exemplum that they want to emulate. Vespasian, when he comes to power after civil wars, is both creating something new, but also modeling himself on, on Augustus. And I say, Trajan, you know, be better than Trajan because of you know, the expanse of the empire and the stability and all the success he brought. Although you see immediately after him that Hadrian is trying to sort of consolidate and rein things in and not spread too thin because that's kind of what Trajan sort of did. Yeah. So I hope that sort of answers your question. What later history thinks of him, he still held up as one of the, you know, the models, um, which is interesting because he, you know, we compare to other sort of great models of, of, of leaders or generals from the past, like Alexander the Great, who's perpetually sort of thought of by the Romans and the subsequent. Uh, civilizations and cultures as the military leader you want to emulate. Augustus is not that. He's not the great military leader. Uh, he has great military commanders under him, but he is the... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Sort of like work for people, but if you look at statues of the Emperor Augustus, one of the things that Alexander always does in his statues, he has a sort of little tilt. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and you look at statues of Augustus, and loads of them have Little tilt. <laughs> now you look at him in books and you'll see, look at the neck, because they're all everybody in the book adjusts the head so it goes square right, on yeah. like that. But if you look at the neck, you can see that most of the Augustan ones yeah. are doing that. Yeah. And that I would argue, in a, another course in another place, is subliminal propaganda mm. by Augustus saying, I'm a bit like Alexander. I'm not actually putting that in your face, mm. but the iconography yeah. is making little suggestions. And he had Alexander as a student. Yeah, what 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 one of the stories that circulates about his birth, yeah. Um yeah, Alexander is an immensely sort of popular figure for the Romans of um Augustus' age and the generation before to emulate, you know, um the great conqueror of the East. Uh, in terms of what he achieved at a very young age, um and the, the, the extent of his empire. Um yeah. Um, a general, general question now. We've got um, we've got Hannah from Birmingham University and have Andy from Manchester University, and I know some of you have spoken about uh, a desire to do classics of ancient history and archaeology at university. I wonder if you could both give us a bit of uh, insight into uh, what your departments are looking for in to the courses you offer in your faculty? I would say first and foremost, an enthusiasm for the subject. I like it, and this goes for any, any, any course you're applying to for a university in the UCAS form, is to show why you want to study that at the university, why you want to spend three years of your life studying something. And if you can, sort of demonstrate, support that with concrete evidence. You know, why are you interested in studying archaeology or classical literature? What is it about it that interests you and intrigues you. Um, we, with the course of the Birmingham, we, apart from anyone who's applying to do classics, which has a language requirement, um, all our other course, courses, the classical literature and civilization, ancient history, archaeology, um, and various combinations therein, um, we have grade requirements, but it doesn't matter what subject they're in, because we're not expecting everyone to have had the opportunity, you know, um, to, to necessarily study classical civilization and literature. If you have, great. Um, yeah. What is your language requirement? So, talking about to actually study, do we have to learn Latin or no? no. So, I, we have one degree classics, which there is a language entry requirement. People might have normally have done Latin previously, and the course requires you to do language every single year. All other courses, there is no language requirement. It's not part, and it's not a requirement of your degree program. But if you want to, you can learn Latin. Latin. You can okay. learn ancient Greek. You can learn Egyptian. Uh, it's there if you want, but it's not, you, don't, you can go with your whole, whole degree course not doing it, you can give it a go in your first year and go, Ooh, not for me, glad I tried it, or you're like, yeah, this is great, I'm going to keep going. Okay. So that'd be exactly the same. Yeah, okay. so, um, there are, there's a very small, very dedicated programme where we sort of expect you to come up with the languages, yeah. otherwise the teaching will be in English, yeah. um, you will have an opportunity to learn again, we, we do hieroglyphs as well, we've got an Egyptology part of, of our department, um, 
And my attitude will be, because we do it in the first year, first year at Manchester, I don't know if it probably is the same at Birmingham, yeah. the marks don't yeah. actually count to your degree profile. So what oh, you can okay. do is you can yeah. dip your toe in the water. Yeah. Uh, and if you like it, and you know, I was forced to do this at secondary school, grammar school in Lancaster. I, re I gave my parents earache something rotten the <laughs> before, right? And then I discovered in a month, actually, A, I liked it, B, I could do it, and that's why I'm talking to you now. And so um, there is something to be said for having a try. But I think yeah. both our institutions would say uh, that's without any compromise to your good self. Absolutely. If you want to walk yeah, yeah. away, nobody will think the worst of you for doing yeah. it. Right. Um, but you know, you've got that chance. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank it's you. It's the same for the first year, you've got a pass, but it's not going to actually contribute to your final degree. degree. It's just the second and third year. Thank you. And otherwise, I'd say exactly the same as Hannah. I mean, the most important thing for all of you is if you're going to go to uni, do something that you want to do. And I say that actually from, from out of my self-interest because I know that students who are interested in what they do will spend time reading that extra book and doing things. You will get a better degree doing something you're interested in than something you think is easy because you'll find it's not easy and then you'll get bored and you won't do the work. Uh, the other thing I'd say is always be inquiring and challenging. Uh, we have a research seminar on Thursday afternoons. So when I sit down, my first thought is how am I going to disagree with the speaker? <laughs> yeah. um, because I'm a, you know, I, I'm a Platonist, I, I'm a great believer in dialectic. We only progress by arguing, not pumping each other, obviously, but arguing <laughs> and experimenting with ideas. And if you, you know, what I don't like in students are people who just think, oh, this bloke can now just give me the right answers. And you, know, you sit there as a sponge and absorb things. What I want you to do, I love arguing with students. I love students who argue with texts. As someone who does philosophy here yeah. at A-level, do you think it will actually benefit me in the long run doing classics as well, like it, during my classics course? Yes, I, I would say so. And again, I mean, I, I'm sure Hannah will tell you the same Birmingham. We have a philosopher in the department, so if you want to explore classical philosophy, um, that's something you can do all the way through an undergraduate career at Manchester. Okay. That was my focus. <laughs> Maybe it's an impossible question. What one book about Rome should they read? Besides the textbook, is there one good book? I, there, are, there are several good books. There's probably one about Rome. Well, I mean, depends. Like, but my first question is, do you mean a book from the classical period? Yeah. About, about, say, uh, in which case, I would say, read Virgil's Aeneid. Right? Um, and, uh, as, as, as a background, and read all of it. Yeah? Don't, don't yeah, yeah. just read the first bit of book eight, read all of it. Um, so, as a, as a book like that, if you're, if you're doing the Emperor Augustus, I would say read Sir Ronald Simon's book, The say. Roman Revolution, but miss out the prosopography chapter because it's murder. <laughs> I would say, um, when you read Ronald Simon's Roman Revolution, just be aware of the date it was originally published. Absolutely. So, 1939. Remember, this is, young, Explains a lot. No, this is a young left-wing British intellectual writing in response really to the rise more of Mussolini than anyone else. Yeah, okay, yeah. But, 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 you know, again, uh, we're very, very good in the classics at saying to people, ancient texts, authors, they've got axes to grind. Modern authors have axes to grind, so, again, just checking out a little bit when somebody says, read this textbook about X, go onto Wikipedia, see who this guy was, yeah? And then find out, so, for example, uh, I think it was Neil Faulkner, um, he was a leading light in the Socialist Workers' Party. Now, that matters, yeah? That matters. It matters to know that when you write, read something by me, if you were foolish enough to do so, that I'm a Tory councillor, right? That matters too. So, nobody, there's no such thing as a view from nowhere. And if you're picking up tendencies in ancient authors, it's worth remembering there'll be tendencies nowadays as well. History is not <laughs> Right, shall we uh, show our appreciation to Helen for giving us